werken. Thank you, David. I'm very happy to be here with you in Jerusalem today with all of you here in this room and those who join us via live streaming in New York and all over the world. I'd like to give you belated uh, greetings and congratulations. Chag Sameach. We have representatives from JTS here, members of the board, members of the faculty, Jack Wertheimer, Jill Roth, Judy Hauptman, Barry Holtz. They all came, especially Joel Roth is here for the semester, but the others made the trip especially to be here today at this conference to celebrate Yom Atzma'ut, the day of independence of the State of Israel, marking 70 years of independence. We recited the prayer of Hallel about 10 days ago on Yom Atzma'ut, and we said how good is our lot and how pleasant we have a pleasant life. We lead a pleasant life. This is not just something that we recite in blessings. It's true because we have the ability, the possibility of living in this time of the renewal of the State of Israel. The late Chancellor Gerson Cohen asked Shimon Greenberg, after Cohen was appointed chancellor, asked him to look into the possibility of having a Beit Midrash of JTS in Jerusalem. And in fact, in 1984, a Beit Midrash was established. First, it was held in the Shokan Institute, and eventually it became the Schechter Institute. I have here a copy of the memo that Greenberg sent Cohen in July 1974, he envisioned the establishment of a center for the study of theological and philosophical issues that Judaism encounters in a Beit Midrash atmosphere that will develop into something bigger than just one department. This was the initiative of the JTS here in Israel. In addition to the rabbinical students who were here from the JTS, they had been coming for many years to spend a year here in Israel. This new program reflects the fact that we regard the basic unity between Israelis and world Jewry as a deep-seated part of our heritage. And he added at the time that this ongoing unity of our people ultimately depends on searching jointly for answers to the basic challenges that Judaism deals with. Indeed, this is the very topic that we will be discussing here today at this conference. Our question is, how can we search together for answers to those basic challenges that Judaism copes with? It's not surprising that Israelis perceive the Jewish world differently than do Jews in North America. Despite the common ground, and there is, of course, common ground, there are significant deep-seated differences. A state is not a voluntary community. A small minority, less than 2% of the general population, is totally different from the overwhelming majority in a sovereign state. The state of Israel and Eretz Israel are certainly at the heart of the culture in North America. The State of Israel takes a marginal role in 
North America, not a central one, and perhaps the same thing can be said for culture. The state of Israel is culturally marginal to the cultural identity of Jews in North America. I think this can be said too for the identity of traditional Jews, conservative Jews, vis-a-vis -vis the traditional Jews here in Israel. Let us investigate these questions here today. Let's ask what are the challenges we face, the halachic challenges here in Israel and in the US? What are the challenges that we face as educators here in Israel vis-a-vis -vis educators in America? There is a lot of common ground. There is also a lot that is different. This is what we'll be discussing here today. We hope we'll be talking with resolution, determination, hope, and passion to find a way to bridge the gaps, or at least at the very least, to open an ongoing conversation on the basic issues that we face on both sides. Otherwise, society here in Israel will develop in one direction, while the Jewish community in the US will be developing in a totally different direction. And without a conversation between the two, we will simply drift apart, further and further apart. And this is simply inconceivable. We are here today to celebrate together, to think together, to dream together, and perhaps even to plan together. I would like to end by thanking David Golinkin and the team of the Schechter Institute for enabling us to hold this conference and for organizing everything. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Eisen. I would now like to call upon Professor Doran Barr, the president of the Schechter Institute for Jewish Studies. Thank you, Professor David Golinkin. Thank you, Professor Arnie Eisen, Chancellor of the JTS. There's no doubt that all of us here are happy and proud. We are marking with great pride, pride not just the fact that we are celebrating 70 years of independence in Israel, we are also celebrating the deep ties between Israel and American Jewry and the ties between the Schechter Institute and the JTS. It is symbolic that one institute is in New York and the other in Jerusalem. These are two important centers, historic centers of Judaism and its various activities over the years and the generations. Just as the visionaries who uh, thought up the idea of the state of Israel would be amazed to see the actual state of Israel and see what a huge success it is, so too would the flourishing JTS and Schechter Institute be a credit to the Founding Fathers. This is a pluralistic, liberal atmosphere enabling people from all walks of life, every type of person and student to come participate. Go back 30, 40 years, we would be looking at a little building perched on a hilltop, a few dozen students, that's all. Now when we are talking about the end of uh, the second decade of the millennium, millennium, hundreds of students come to the schools, the curriculum, the Bet Midrash. We even have students from abroad, from the US, South America, and other places. The vision of the founding fathers and mothers is now has now come true they made their mark we are a constant presence on the Israeli scene and a bridgehead for ties between Israel and the diaspora I want to devote a few words to the fascinating topic that we will be addressing Israel and the Jews of North America the question is how can we 
lessen the widening gaps between the two communities. In 1837, a young man came to Jerusalem named Aaron, he, Moshe Aaron. He was about 30, 35 years old. He went to Tzfat and then to Jerusalem. Nobody knows about his origins, crimson near Brno, Brno in uh, Czech, the Czech Republic of today. This was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He came to Jerusalem, lived in the Muslim quarter, then in the Jewish quarter. His children uh, moved to Western Jerusalem. They lived in Mea Shearim, then to the ba Batei Ungarin Mea Shearim community, then to Geula. Why am I telling you of Moshe Aaron? Baumgarten was his last name. He was my mother's great-great-great-grandfather. And he traversed Europe and came eventually to Jerusalem. He wasn't a Zionist. Zionism didn't even exist at the time. He was a scholar. He studied and wanted to realize in person next year we will celebrate in Jerusalem that we say in our prayers. What would have happened had he not decided to realize his dream and come to Jerusalem? What would the Baumgarten family look like today? What did they do at the end of the 19th century that changed our lives? Would they go to Ellis Island, to America? Would they end up, uh, would they have ended up in the Lower East Side, Buenos Aires? They might have stayed in Moravia. They could never have anticipated the Holocaust that happened 100 years after Moshe Aaron left his place of birth. Is this Zionism? Is this fate? Is this the destiny? In Genesis, God tells Abraham to leave his home, leave his father's house, leave his country, and go to the place God decides to show him. We are still talking about the place the Jews should be. Should everybody leave their home and come to Israel, make Aliyah, and establish the Jewish homeland here in the state of Israel, in Eretz Israel? Most Israelis and most uh, classic Zionists thought, yes, that all Jews must come to Israel. I don't think so. I am a Zionist. I was born here in Jerusalem. I love this country despite all its problems, but I am not convinced that the one and only legitimate place in the world for Jews is here in Israel. Jews have led such a complex life and have had such a complex history. Some places flourished. Judaism is changing and being molded even as we speak. There are still places where Jewish life is endangered, at risk. There is anti-Semitism and other problems. But we must remember that the State of Israel is not the only solution to the question of continuity of the Jewish people. There's about 150 years here of new, renewed life as opposed to hundreds and hundreds of years of Jewish life throughout history. We do not have any kind of monopoly on the Jewish people. All over the world in Jewish communities, Jews mold their identities, their cultural, religious, and intellectual identity. Throughout generations, Jews were open to their surroundings, influenced them, and were influenced by them, and developed as a result. Unfortunately, here in Israel, we are witnessing the opposite trend we are becoming more and more closed and withdrawn, turning inward. This trend is no less dangerous than external threats to Jewish lives and uh, the continuity of the Jewish people. For that reason, this conference is so important. There's no doubt that this issue and other issues that we'll be dealing it with will highlight the points that we share. I know that we will be discussing the connections between Jews here in Israel and abroad, and we will focus on North American Jews. This hopefully will be the first of a series of sessions dealing with Israel and its ties with the diaspora and the question of how to bridge the gaps. I, too, would like to thank all those who made this conference possible. I thank our sponsors. 
JTS and the Schechter Institute, Mr. Robert Bob Rifkin, Mary Sanders, and all the others. I thank them for their generosity. I thank everybody who made this conference possible. Professor Arnie Eisen and Professor David Golinkin, who worked so hard at organizing the conference. Moria Karsagi Aron, the producer. Dr. Simcha Goldschmidt, Vicky, Rabbi Deutsch, Dr. Ackerman, Dr. Leibovich, and Doron Sagir. And I thank all the speakers who will be participating here today with special thanks to the professors from JTS who came especially to be with us, Professor Arnie Eisen, Professor Judith Hauptman, Professor Barry Holtz, and Professor Jack Wertheimer. May we all enjoy many more years of a flourishing state of Israel here at the Schechter Institute and at JTS. We deal with similar issues and problems to enrich Jewish life, Jewish intellectual life, and Jewish culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Professor Barr. And now we now the speakers from the first first session, please come to the stage. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Ari Ackerman, the moderator. He's the dean of the Stachter Institute of Jewish Studies. Good afternoon. And welcome to the first session on Jewish education as part of this joint conference of the Schechter Institute and the JTS on on the connection between Israel and the and the, and the Jews of Northern America. When we sat together, representatives of the Institute and representatives of JTS, and we de deliberated over which topics are appropriate for a joint conference that's celebrating 70 years of Israel's independence, we reached the conclusion 
quite quickly that we should dedicate the conference to rethinking together about the problems between the relationships between Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. And I think that we were right. It seems that there is interest in this problem. It's a problem that concerns us all. And that is the deteriorating relationship between Israel and the diaspora, especially recently the problems between in the relationships between the two largest com Jewish communities in the world, the Jewish community in Israel and the Jewish community in North America. And although the relationships between these communities always suffered conflict and, and communication problems, we are now facing an era of that is especially challenging. We can, we might say that the foundations of the relationship that existed beforehand are no longer relevant, and it is possible that the that the title "Bridging the Gaps" is too delicate, delicate, because we might actually have to change the paradigm. The way we define the problem and the way we imagine the solution, it is it was clear to us that the solution has to address the field of education, both in Israel and in North America. Just like any problem that is faced by the Jewish by the Jewish world, if we want to reach a sustainable solution, a deep solution so deep solution, then we need the ed the educational system has to be recruited in order to cope with the cope with the problem, which is why it was important to us to open the conference with a discussion on Jewish education. And we gathered four educators, very senior educators, who are involved in both theory and practice of Jewish education. Each is active in at least one of these centers, and we asked them to express their opinion on what can be derived of Jewish education in order to cope with the problems with the relationship between the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. I asked each speaker to speak for only 15 minutes in order to leave time for questions and discussion. And at this point, I would like to also invite those that are joining us online to send in questions to the different speakers. You can access our Facebook page in either English or Hebrew write comments on the live stream of this conference on Facebook, type in your questions, and we will collect all of the questions and address them at the end of the session. We'll take a few questions from the audience at home. I will introduce each of the speakers separately. Each speaker has a very impressive resume, but I will try to be concise in order to save time and introduce and present only the relevant information. The first speaker is Dr. Eitan Shikli. Dr. Shikli is a leader and executive director of the Tali Education Fund since 1994. In addition, he completed PhD in the joint program between the Schechter Institute and JTS on the history of, educa of education in Israel. He's a, lecturer on, he's a lecturer in the Schechter Institute and in other institutions. Good afternoon. I was given an extra two minutes beyond the time that everyone else has in order to present someone, the principal managers and colleagues, she, which is very, that is very related to our, pro, to our program. We're talking about a group of 19 principals who spend three days each month at the end of, a, of their work day. They study until late at night at the end of the school year. This will be, Not three days a month, three days a week. You wish it, you might wish it was three days a month. Strike that they will spend a week. They will spend a week in the in New York, meeting the Jew, Jewish community in New York. Um, 
I would like to add one sentence. One of the principles from this group is missing today. Ms. Sarit Angel or is sitting Shiva for her daughter or Angel who was killed in the horrible tragic flood flood incident. I would like to dedicate this this session to the memory of this child as the, her family talks to, her family talked about how how the unity of the Jewish people was so important to her. We are all very, we all feel very close to Sarid, who is missing, who is absent today. Okay, so now start, you could start the clock now. We, it's very important to begin this session with the method, with a method, methodological introduction. I will want to refer to an article that I wrote on, wrote on Ynet and another article that will be published in English in the near future. Some of the things that I may say, that I say may sound insulting to some of our brethren uh, in the United States. I have no intention of insulting anyone or of hurting anyone. Everything that I say today comes from my feeling of love and caring and desire to draw others closer. people like myself and as all of the as everyone has said so far we have a very deep debt to the to the Jews of the United States for their support for their philanthropy there are hundreds of organizations that play a very very important role in the state of Israel and therefore I speak every word that I say is full of respect and honor. However, I believe that dialogue means saying, saying, gen, sharing genuine thoughts. I cannot speak on behalf of the Israelis, just as no one here, no one else can. I want to present a voice that is when it, it's heard from politicians, it sounds terrible. Their attack to think of 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 M K Chotoveli and others. This is very damaging. But however, I would tr I want to try to reflect the religious perspective on the one hand, the role when in the context of Jewish education and its role in bridging the gap between the state of Israel and the Jews of North America. The question is, what is the gap? What is bothering us? What is the problem? From the American perspective. I might say that there are two main things that concern our brethren in the United States. First of all, it is the insulting and discriminating approach to the liberal denominations in the state of Israel. It is humiliating, it is an insulting attitude. They do, their leadership is not acknowledged. Their rabbis are not recognized. And this is, and, and this is a, this is a, sh uh, this is a shame for all of us. Another problem is the perspective, what we as Israelis do. Who do we elect? What the po the policies that the go Israeli government implements? Uh, it seems that most of our brethren in the United States that belong to the Democratic Party or are close to the Democratic Party and are driven by human, humanistic, universal principles. It's very difficult for them to see the pictures that are taken in, the, in Israel as they appear in the United States. It's painful for them and that creates tension between us. This was reflected in an article written by Ron Lauder about a month ago, and if you can just move ahead with the pre in the presentation, this is what Ron Lauder wrote in his article that was published in the United States. He blamed. He said that part of the assimilation in the United States is the result of the Jews' disappointment in things that in what is in the go policy of the Israeli government. So this is usually the parameter that we focus on when we talk about the relationship between the Jews in Israel and the Jews in the United States. And I wanted to try to present another aspect of this conflict, of this tension, and. That is how the way that 
people in the Jews of the United States act cause the Jews in Israel to distance themselves from them. We always talk about why Israel is at fault. And in my opinion, it's very important to also understand what about the attitude of the American Jewry cause, causes young, Jew, young Jews in Israel to be either indifferent to what happens there or to be antagonistic about it. And I am basing my opinion on conversations that I have had. It's very important to me. It's very important to the Tali Fund as an educational institute. institute. It's important for the principals that will visit the United States. We want to enrich them with this dialogue, with this narrative, and I want to present my insights to you. The first thing is, of course, and I'm going to sound like David Ben-Gurion, the first thing is the old Zionist ethos. You'll be surprised to hear that a lot of Israelis are still pained by the fact that half of the Jewish nation is not involved, is not actually involved, not only financial involvement, but not actually involved in the incredible chapter of the history of the Jewish people, the most incredible chapter over the last 2,000 years. It's painful for me, it's painful to many people in this auditorium that that, this, that community lives abroad because beyond the fact that you're not here to help us resolve some of our problems, it sends a message to our enemies that the state of Israel is nice to have, but it's not a necessity. Look how happy and florid and successful we are abroad. Just one, that's the first point to ponder. The second point is that not only is this an issue of reality, but an uh, and if new ideology is being developed, not only are we happy abroad and it's difficult for us to leave, there's an entire ideology around this. The, I read a book by my colleague and professor about people who believe, who follow this ideology. What I'm showing here on the on the slide is something from the most popular Jewish Jewish newspaper in the United States, with about one and a half million readers, in in honor of independ the Jew Israel's Independence Day. This was its title. It's time for Israel to recognize that the diaspora Jews are already home. This is insulting. I. Even though I, 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 began, I began by asking you not to be insulted, but I was almost insulted by this, by this headline. It says that diaspora is a good thing. It's thriving. And what can you do? But a lot of the, a lot of the Jews we, in, in Israel, we hear about what happens to Jews around the world. Just this week, we heard what the German chancellor said in Germany uh, about the petition, petition signed by Sarkozy in France about the laws in Scandinavia to try to prohibit Brit Mila and, Ko and Kashrut. This is something that makes Israelis who live in Israel feel terrible. They don't understand why you, why you live there. And if that's the way the American population looks at the diaspora, then they're blind. The third point that I would like to make is that depending on the, the the party or the faction that we belong to what some of the is some of the israelis feel it's very it's difficult for israelis to accept the fact that jews that not all jews participate in the burden of defending the country our our friends, our family, our fa our fathers, our brothers, our sons all serve in the army. We all know how difficult it is. It is very easy to be critical. We heard the Pope recommend that the entire world lay down its arms. I'm, of course, that sounds wonderful. Of course, I'm in favor of peace. The diaspora likes to preach to the. Some, sounds like it preaches to the world. As Professor Eisen said, we're a people of the book, but I also learned that Judaism is not only ideology, it's also actions. And here we're talking about actions, difficult actions, and all of Jewish morality is, face, is challenged each and every day. We're, we face very difficult challenges, and I think it's very difficult for us to accept criticism in this field. Another issue that distances Israeli Jews from American Judy from the American Jewry is the horrible assimil assimilation 
in the United States and in the diaspora in general. On, here on the screen, you can see results of the Pew recent study from 2013 the percentage of intermarriage if you f ignore the ultra -ortho uh, the orthodox population where there's very little intermarriage we're talking about 70% intermarriage among jewish among american jewry you can say who cares my, during my last visit to the United States, I met a lot of people who said, okay, and so what, it's not a big deal, so there'll be two million Jews less. But it hurts me, it pains me to hear that because I care. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to teach them a lesson, but it, it hurts me, it's painful for me. And I think it's very painful for a lot of Israelis, the, Jew, the, the Jews of the United States are gradually disappearing. Do you want us to be indifferent? Does it sound like we're, we're trying to be critical? I share the pain. S parts of some, some leaders present that as an opportunity. Israelis cannot understand that. And the last thing, as something that distances Israelis from uh, their brethren in the United States, is th the attempt of some of the Jewish leadership to talk about the dual centrality uh, of the Jewish nation. But guarantee, in order to guarantee the future of the Jewish people, it is that the community in the United States is almost equal to the existence of the Jewish of Jewish people in the state of Israel, and this is very difficult for for many Israelis to hear. This is these are my insights on the gap on the the, the gaps between Israel between Israelis Israeli Jews and American Jewry. And once you understand where the gap is, you understand why education is so complicated. So what can contribute to Jewish education? I'll leave that to my colleagues from JTS to talk about the challenges of Jewish education in the United States. I can't try to talk about that, but, but the role of Jewish education is to keep the Jews Jews. That's something that I understand very clearly. Another thing that may connect to my final sentence, don't only tell them about Israel, maybe maybe in, incorporate Zionism into some of your curriculums. I want to focus on the state of Israel and to try to understand what is the right thing for Jewish education to do, and especially what my, my organization is trying to do. I think that Jewish education in both of the communities should create a common denominator between the two. When you, there are children in two parts of the world that speak a common language, I wish how wonderful it would be for everyone to speak Hebrew, but fewer and fewer children in the United States speak Hebrew. They used to teach to, to, to teach Hebrew in schools, learning the Hebrew language, connect the the children the language that the children speak, create a shared culture for these for children. The state of Israel. Learning about the state of Israel it has to. There has to in is the state in Israel. We have to learn about the very existence of a Jewish diaspora. There ha we have to create a common denominator of familiarity uh, with one another. In the state of Israel, I want to emphasize two or three things, and then I want to talk about things that we tried to do but that didn't necessarily work. The state of Israel. I think that Tali is a system that. Has, that is inspired by the edu by education in the United States. The Tali Education Fund includes over 300 institutes, including preschools and schools. We were inspired by Solomon Schechter School in the United States. The parents that founded Tali were American parents who moved, who immigrated to Israel, and contributed to Israeli society. They. They they paved the golden path between Orthodox and conservative Judaism. That was the idea. The, the idea of Tali. The idea was that Jews, in the most natural way, lived in a plur pluralist environment with moderate, tolerant, contain inclusive. Judaism, and they came to a very extreme society in Israel and realized that a 
I, a, an institute of this kind didn't exist. It, what they did was they came and they set, they turned on the light. They established an incredible system that now includes thousands of students. Tali is an initiative is the initiative of American Jews who came to Israel. Michal Berman, head of, Yagun, of the Panim organization, also joined. Uh, many other organizations joined this initiative. The Organization for Jewish Re Recreate Rebirth was also joined. And they, inco they incorporated the concept of religious pluralism into Israeli society, which used to be a completely foreign concept. So this is an excellent example of what American Aliyah can do for the state of Israel. This is a system that is just at the beginning of being reinforced and strengthened. Jewish education in Israel. And I read an abstract of a lecture on this topic by Professor Eisen, who wrote how important it is to in, for us to speak with our colleagues. And for the next two minutes, I want to talk about two attempts in which that are related to this. One attempt is a program called Friends Over the Sea. Many of you are familiar with this program. Its goal is to cause the children on both sides of the ocean to understand that there are Jews on, on either side and that we have to care about one another. And this is a program that is running in several dozen Tali schools, but in the United States, they don't have the time to run this program because between Hebrew studies and basic and general studies, they don't have time. And it's very difficult for us to find schools in the United States that can join us in this, in this, in this initiative. A second pl program has several representatives here next year there will be seven we will send 70 tally educators to the united states some believe that meeting others brings people together that might be true but it doesn't always work and i'm very serious sometimes and i quote a principal who just happened to happened to have called me this morning to tell me that she she's recently incorporated Tali into her high school she's the principal of a very large high school in Maalot it, we wanted to bring people together but we failed she said Eitan I was very excited about the struggle for survival of the, Amer the the schools in the United States. We saw very prestigious institutes, JTS, other schools. It's very exciting to see. We visited synagogues and we saw Israeli flags and our heart is with Israel. We cannot help but be moved by the love that the American Jews express towards Israel. But in summary, when I asked the principals what they learned, one of the principals, one of the most intelligent principals said, Eitan, I don't want to learn anything from American Jewry. The this proximity, the visit actually dis actually increased the distance between the two, but I still think it's very important to bring people together for people to meet each other even for the sake of getting to know one, an one another and disagreeing. So we know what we disagree on. And just one last sentence before I give the stage to the next speaker. I look at our future with a lot of hope and a lot of fear. I'm afraid of the, the two things that fear that I fear the most are the ultra orthodox ultra orthodox trend in the United in in the state of Israel and the assimilation in the United States. These are two very dangerous situations. And as I wrote both in Hebrew and in English, I said that if half a million young Israel young Israel young American Jews make Aliyah, this will change the balance in Israel. It will change who the, who the, the change the leadership in Israel, and I will think it will also resolve part of the assimilation process. May, it, may this come true. Thank you, Dr. Shikli, for these thought-provoking remarks. When we planned this session, 
I was worried that it would be sleepy, boring, there wouldn't be anything that could spark a discussion, an argument. I'm not worried anymore now following Eitan's talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Beverly Gribbitz, who was the principal of the Ramaz School in New York. She founded Tehila, the Tehila Secondary School in Jerusalem, and she is now the principal of the Evelina de Rothschild School in Jerusalem. She has a PhD in Jewish education from JTS, and recently she was awarded the Solomon Schechter Award for outstanding work in Jewish education in Israel and overseas. The current speaker is speaking in English. The speaker is speaking in English. The speaker is speaking in English for those listening on the streaming.
okay? Thank you, Beverly, for that fascinating comparison. Our third speaker is Professor Barry Holtz, the Baumreiter Professor of Jewish Education at JTS. Professor Herz Holtz was Dean of Jewish Education at JTS from 2008 to 2013, and has recently published a book on Rabbi Akiva at Yale University Press. the nature of that gap might be. To ask the question, how can we bridge the gap between Israel and North America through the means of education, throws out a challenge to educators, both here and in America. And it is not unlike other uses of education as a resource of social engineering a term I use in a positive sense, though it may sometimes have negative overtones in other contexts. The track record of education and social engineering is a mixed bag because the influence of education on human behaviors and attitudes is less powerful than we might hope. Getting, to wear, getting people to wear seat belts in cars very successful. Getting people to stop smoking, fairly successful. Getting to people to love their neighbors as themselves, <laughs> sadly, not so successful. But the reason why we turn to education as a means of social change is precisely because we have so few other means to do so. Therefore, if we understand better what we mean by 
gap, perhaps we might have a better chance of understanding how much education could help in bridging that gap. Let me try out a few ideas. We might suggest that this gap is essentially a gap of knowledge on both sides. The American side vis-a-vis -vis Israel, the Israeli side vis-a-vis -vis America. In some ways, this portrait of a binary knowledge gap is accurate, but in other ways it is misleading. Because the nature of knowledge, when applied to what American Jews know about Israel, is of a different sort than the lack of knowledge that Israelis have about America. Here is, the, here is a hypothesis. This is not based on research, but on my own anecdotal and personal experience. American Jewish adults know a certain amount about Israel, perhaps through their Jewish education in a formal context, perhaps through reading the newspaper, and some of this uh, Beverly um, alluded to, perhaps by visiting Israel, perhaps even through their rabbi's sermons. This knowledge may be broad, but it is not very deep. Some of this may be what I call sentimental knowledge. That is, the Israel of kibbutzim, orange groves, and dancing the hora. For younger American Jewish adults, it's about what they learned, there are air quotes around the word learned here, in 10 days on a birthright trip. For somewhat more engaged or sophisticated adults, the knowledge, for better or worse, is about the Middle East conflict, the peace process, the Palestinians, etc. For a smaller number, the knowledge might be about the religious differences between American Judaism's landscape and the majority of religious Jews in Israel. Once again, this is not likely to be deep knowledge but it is what North American Jews will think about if Israel is the topic. And this applies to people no matter where they stand on the political spectrum. Their conclusions may be different, but the facts remain the same. The problem for American Jewish educators is answering the following question. What really is the topic that should be at the heart of any curriculum about Israel. Is it Israel in the current events sense? Is it Israel in classic Zionist theory? Is it Israel within Israel's internal politics or Israeli culture or Israeli technology? Is it the Eretz Yisrael of the Bible? For a certain segment of non-Orthodox American Jews, knowledge about religious life in Israel will matter a lot. The issue of egalitarianism, women at the Kotel, issues about marriage and divorce, conversion to Judaism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to review this for, for this audience. I can't give you any numbers, but we all know that when conservative or reformed Jews come to Israel, or read about these matters back in the United States, they feel perplexed or alienated. Most of all, they feel the gap because of the power of the Rabbanut here, and they feel alienated because of having been raised in a culture in which church, in quotes, and state are separate. In this case, we have to admit, sometimes a gap is really a gap. But what about the other side, Israelis' knowledge about America? And here I would say is where the imbalance is most clearly seen. American Jews knew a little bit about a lot of things concerning Israel. But I would suggest that Israelis know a lot about America, simply because of America's role in world politics, America's importance for Israel militarily, and because of what you might call the American hegemony in Western culture. Movies, popular music, cable television, basketball. 
My family and I were living here uh, on the Shabbaton about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we were living in Baca, and we had a membership at Brechat Yerushalayim, and um, we used to go there pretty regularly. And my son was a um, my son was six, um, and there was a, a teenage um, lifeguard, a very cool lifeguard. My my son found him fascinating. My son is uh, interested in cool. <laughs> and now that he's 26, he's he himself is very cool. <laughs> um, anyway. So I got to talking with this uh, lifeguard who uh, spoke English really well. So I said to him, do you have uh, Anglo parents or one parent? He said, no, 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 no. I said, my God, the Israeli school system is fantastic. Like, I didn't realize how well you learn English. And he said, nah, it's cable TV. <laughs> this is American hegemony. So Israelis know a lot about America, but by and large they know almost nothing about American Judaism or American Jews aside from some stereotypes or even ridiculous stereotypes. Well, how do I know this? Well, uh, Beverly uh, alluded to it already, talking about her school. Um, we know this for many years. Um, when the Israeli Mishlachet comes to work at um, American Jewish summer camps. And um, sort of the um, surprises that they are, uh, encounter, I'm most familiar with the Camp Ramah system, but it's true in uh, other camps as well. Um, I've had this experience of Israeli kids coming to America after the army and being rather surprised how they were welcomed by these American Jewish communities. Um, they didn't quite get, like, why, why were they being so welcomed? Uh, because um, they, they didn't, uh, you know, that was something um, a little foreign to them. Um, now, I, I, thanks to something that Eitan mentioned about these textbooks, which are very, in, this is very interesting to me. I did know a few years ago when I was, uh, working with um, the Mandel Foundation, we ran a program where we brought uh, a, a group of American Jewish educators for a seminar for a couple of weeks at the uh, Mandel Leadership um, Institute here in Jerusalem. And we wanted to do something in which um, we would look at the way something is taught in America and something is taught in Israel, and then we would have the teachers like compare and et cetera. And we thought the subject we were gonna do was teaching Israel. But the problem was that when we looked for textbooks here in Israel about teaching diaspora Jews or teaching the American Jewish community, we couldn't find any, so we ended up doing this around Bible, which was all very nice, but not what we had in mind. I want to commend to you, um, something kind of hot off the presses done by some uh, person known to many people in this room, and that is uh, Ilan Ezrahi uh, just published a paper, uh, like a booklet, 40-page booklet, uh, published by UJ Federation of New York, in which he reviewed um, the literature on Israelis' perception of American Jews. It's a, he just sent it to me the other day, quite accidentally not realizing I was going to be talking about that. And it's really quite interesting and, and kind of confirms a lot, of, a lot of this. I mean, there are some very positive things that Israelis feel about American Jews, but um, the lack of knowledge is very uh, powerful. How can the gap be bridged? So I would say that there is a knowledge gap on both sides and that the nature of that gap is different. And there are different challenges on both sides. On the American side, the great advantage for addressing the knowledge gap is that there are well-organized, well-intentioned, and sometimes even well-funded institutional resources in place, Jewish summer camps, Jewish community centers, 
day schools, congregational schools, etc., and all of them want to do something about teaching Israel. And the challenge on the American side, as I suggested a few minutes ago, is what exactly should that curriculum be about? And this is related to another significant point. I've been talking mostly about knowledge in these remarks, but is knowledge really the goal anyway? What the title of this conference suggests or implies in using the word gap is what I might consider an emotional disconnect, a lack of connection. And isn't the goal instead being about some kind of attachment or maybe even love? I have focused on knowledge of the other because in human history we know a good deal more about how to teach another person some subject matter knowledge than we know how to teach someone how to love something. But by and large, educational institutions are better set up to teach knowledge. I do believe that knowledge can come, uh, I'm sorry, that love can come through knowledge. It is not a bad pathway. It's not the only pathway. And I think that the challenge for North American Jews is to find ways to, um, to create this linkage of knowledge and um, commitment, or knowledge and attachment. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to add one final thing that I hope might be addressed later on in this conference, what I'd call an ideological component. This is not a simple suggestion but I'll throw it out anyway. For a long time now, people in Jewish educational circles in America, people that I know, have talked about the need or the desirability for a new vision of Zionism, appropriate in our times, in the circumstances of current realities, appropriate to the American context. I'm not sure that vision will lead to eight times 500,000 people making Aliyah, but I think the time has come and maybe it's even a little bit too late. What will inspire the minds and hearts of young people without dragging out tired notions that work very well for my generation and my parents' generation, but don't have the same magic for younger Jews today? And I would say, um, on the other side, that um, I think an interesting and important project uh, here in Israel would be to really take on seriously what does it mean for Israelis to really learn about Jews in the diaspora and being as the United States is the world's largest diaspora and the wealthiest and probably the most influential, that um, what it would mean to create a sense of uh, Klal Yisrael as um, felt on this side of the ocean as much as it is felt on our side of the ocean so that the gap um, may be at any rate uh, bridged over time. Thank you. Thank you for those important insights. Dr. David Breakstone is our next speaker. Dr. Breakstone is the deputy chairman of the Jewish Agency Executive. He has a PhD from the Hebrew University in Jewish Education and wrote his dissertation on teaching about Israel in the diaspora. And he founded the Herzl Museum on Mount Herzl. in Jerusalem. If ever there was a promised land, we Jewish Americans are living in it. I wasn't planning to begin with a quotation, but when I heard what Eitan 
had to say, quotation from the foreword, I just wanted to say this is nothing new. Professor Jacob Neusner, one of us, wrote that in the Washington Post in 1987, 31 years ago. So if anyone has any doubt that there is a gap after everything we heard, I suppose that quotation from Neusner's piece indicates that yes indeed there is a gap. Like the previous speakers, I'd like to describe this gap as I see it a little differently from the others. Without understanding the nature of the gap, its depth, its width, it will be extremely difficult to bridge it. Just to exemplify this, there definitely is a gap. Let me tell you a little bit about this. Let me tell you about the existing gap without widening it. I've been speaking this year to various people over the past few years. I don't know if you can see here, one of the talks I had with my niece, she was on birthright. It was such a good program. He, she asked me, Uncle David, I have one question. I don't really get why we need a Jewish state. A nephew of mine, over Passover, I was in the States, and he says, the left is against Israel. In other words, he meant occupation is bad. The way Israel relates to the refugees is bad. That's what he was hinting to me. We also have uh, discussions on campus with Jewish activists. I mentioned the Six Day War the other day. For some of us here in this room, the Six Day War was, I don't have to tell you, and they say, oh, that's the beginning of the occupation, right? So I see there's a gap, not just between Israel and uh, the diaspora, there's a generation gap between me and my nieces and nephews that we have to cope with. A few months ago, I met with the board of the American Zionist Movement. We were talking about celebrating 50 years of the unification of Jerusalem. They said celebrate, but the city is still divided. And that's an interesting point, too. This city, Jerusalem, has another aspect that I'd like to discuss here today. I was talking to students studying Jewish education. They had been studying at the Pardes Institute here in Jerusalem for a whole year. At the end of the year, I asked them, I said, what's it going to mean for you when you say next year in Jerusalem in the prayers? And they said, I don't understand what you're asking. That Jerusalem has nothing to do with this one. For them, Jerusalem, even after living here for a whole year, was something totally different from the actual physical ear, li city they were living in. I met with the president of one of the biggest Zionist movements in the US. We discussed Zionism and he said to me, 99% of my friends are pro-Israel, but if I ask them if they're Zionists, they sort of shrug. Few will say they're Zionists. What's even more problematic for me is that one of the leading philosophers of teaching about Israel in the US when we discussed these questions, he said to me, we don't think Zionism is a useful term. Oh, wait just a minute. There are comments from the audience here. We'll get to that in a minute. I tried to hold a conference on Jewish Zionist education here in Jerusalem. I went to the States to try to market this idea. I met with some of the leading figures in American Jewry. One person said, stop talking about the centrality of Israel. 
stop talking about the centrality of Israel in American Jewish life. It isn't. It's integral at the most. We had a very interesting discussion on this point. She uh, is presenting an ideological or maybe a sociological perspective. We don't have time to go into that right now. In the end, it wasn't a conference of Zionist education in Jerusalem. It was supposed to be Zionist education in Jerusalem. In the end, it became Israel and the development of Jewish identity, and it took place in Chicago. I said, fine, I'll go to them. We'll discuss it there. During one of the workshops, I was dialoguing with one of the leaders of a center. I was saying something about diaspora Jews, and he said, stop referring to us as diaspora Jews. We're Jews who live in North America just as you are Jews who live in Israel. It's quite possible that this is quite true. I surmise that most Israelis sitting right here in this room find this extremely problematic. And if it isn't problematic in the US, that's part of the gap that exists between us. I said it's not a value judgment, God forbid. I'm not talking about exile, it's the diaspora. Look, there was a center and people uh, dispersed. She said, no, it's, that's not the case. This attack on the centrality of Israel is uh, growing stronger and stronger when we hear more and more about peoplehood education. Uh, we, the harder it becomes to cope with Israel and all the problems involved, people um, went instead over to peoplehood education. I think that's what happened. This book came out quite a few years ago now, and it discusses the ideal Jewish peoplehood educated. What I'm interested in, some of it is up here, some isn't. Note that, let me just find my place here. trying to navigate the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, please remind the speaker that to get back to the microphone. There's no commitment to the state of Israel. The state of Israel doesn't exist among those characteristics. The ability to use peoplehood language, but nothing about Hebrew language. The purpose of peoplehood education is to instill a sense of collective belonging, commitment, responsibility to the Jewish people, and the future of education and civil education. I'm sure we all agree with that. Where is Israel in all this? The centrality of Israel needs to be revisited, reinterpreted, and rearticulated. In other words, rejected. For me, this is a problem. I'm one of the people who wrote the Jerusalem program that was adopted by the WZO the World Zionist Organization, and it says the unity of the Jewish people and its bond to its, its historic homeland. The centrality of the state of Israel and so forth. That's the gap. Now what do we do about it? Eitan was more modest. He said he wouldn't aspire to tell Americans how to teach about Israel, but I do want to take two or three minutes and present my model. Part of the problem is uh, it's our fault. We taught Zionism. We talked about Zionism. We said a haven for the Jewish people. For many, many years, we went to the US, all over the world, uh, raising funds. We wanted political support to help us build that haven for the Jewish people. But Zionism, from its very inception, talked not only about a haven, but about a homeland. And we simply forgot to tell our friends overseas that besides being a haven, we want a homeland. We want to build our national homeland.
So let me skip if I don't have enough time. Let's forget about the haven, the new generation, the young people that we want to interest despite anti-Semitism in Europe. This is not going to make them come here and we don't have to focus on that in future. We are building our homeland, our national homeland. We are in the process of doing that. A few things must interest us, the people of Israel, the land of Israel, and the Torah of Israel. So much of what happens in our country, here in Israel today, focuses on controversy, around those issues. Who is a Jew, the land of Israel, within the Green Line, outside the Green Line, the Torah. Even if we could all agree what exactly does it mean to keep Shabbat halachically, we still need to ask what the role of halacha, what the role of Torah is in our state. We mentioned, it was mentioned here before, that we asked for economic and political support from Jews overseas. It's no less important to get spiritual support from them. You talked about the Tali schools. You talked about these principals who would be doing some time in the US. I'm sure they'll bring back a lot of uh, thought that will be helpful to us to enrich our conversation about these three issues, less about Israel as a state and more about my connection to the state of Israel, to the land of Israel, to Torah Israel, the Torah. How are these things different here in Israel from the place I live in? I, as a Jew living overseas, I need to find my place. Where do I belong? Where do I fit in? We need to find common ground, a common language. We need to find a short, shared purpose, joint responsibility, mutual concern, commitment to basic values. We have to build up the bridge that will bring us together and diminish the gap. This looks like a home. It's right over my shelter. There are many different ways of building a home and many different ways. We need to find the ways of engagement that will interest Jews overseas to help us design our state and give it form according to the way we decide what it means, the peoplehood, the land of Israel, Torah, this engagement is not a one-way street. It goes both ways. We have to learn from them. They should be learning from us how together we can construct these three areas for mutual benefit. Thank you. Thank you, David, for these remarks, these important remarks. We do have a few minutes for questions. Let's, let's take a few questions from the audience here. And please state who you are addressing. Everybody, I guess. My name is Avi Novis Deutsch, the Dean of the Bet Midrash at the Schechter Institute. This is somewhere between an insight and a question. When the Beton Committee was established, one of the problems I was thinking about is why we don't think about American Jewry. When I went through the Israeli school system, I learned nothing about American Jews that is equal in size to the population of the entire state of Israel. In fact, it was even bigger at the time. And I'm wondering, what can we do about it? Is this um, some kind of purposeful act on the part of someone? Why does the Jew Israeli education system simply ignore American Jews and American Jewry? We'll collect a few questions. Let's pass the microphone around. 
Shalom, my name is Doron Rubin. I'm the chairman of Marum, the Young People's Forum of the Masorti Movement, and I work in the partnership division of the Jewish Agency. I'd like to ask about older people. My mother always quotes George Bernard Shaw and says, education is wasted on the young. Today, in our reality, and some of the speakers mentioned this, the most significant decisions are not made on the part of 12, 13, or 15 year olds. They're made by people who are 30 or older. Where do we connect to that here in Israel as Israelis and as American Jews? One more question. My name is Debbie Weissman. I used to work in this important and distinguished institution. I have a few questions for Eitan. Our rabbi said, a wise man learns from everyone. I was a little disappointed about the story of the principal who doesn't want to learn from everyone in every context. The other thing, you presented a situation where in Canada, intermarriage is much higher than everywhere else, but that goes against everything we study in about modern Judaism. The Canadian model is closer to Australia. Uh, have things changed so much over the past two years? It's just impossible. I'd like you to check that again, those figures on your slide. Let's ask each speaker to respond, and please be as brief as possible. Let's go in opposite order. Please move the microphone closer to the speaker or put the microphone on. Okay, he needs the microphone. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. With the Jewish Federations of North America, we began now a new enterprise, enterprise on a large scale, conducting meetings between young people, Israelis and Jews in North America. It was obvious that if we wanted to change something here in Israel, we absolutely had to ensure that this kind of encounter took place. I don't have time to go into all the details of the program, we're talking about youth movements, the pre-military academies. They certainly stress this aspect of getting to know young people overseas. Eitan spoke about that Tali textbook that addresses this issue. No less important is what we do with Israelis, with Jews overseas to get encounters there. There are several people here in this room who were emissaries on the part of the Jewish agencies. Israelis come back as Jews. We'll be hearing more from Yizar Hess later. I don't know if he would be the director of the Masorti movement in Israel had he not been on Shlichut in America. They come back as Jews. They leave as Israelis and come back as Jews. Many Israelis go to uh, do a stint in communities in Europe, in South America, in the US. We find it less important to get their contribution over that year that they spend in the U.S. It's more important for them to be our ambassador of goodwill when they go back to Israel. I'm talking about young people who go to summer camps and come back here to Israel. 
200 teachers who go as shlichim. These are important projects to bring about an encounter between young Israelis and the reality in North America. Um, something Debbie Weitzman said. Um, I think it's a really interesting question to explore what can the two cultures learn from one another. And I don't think it's uh, simple because the context, as has come out here already, the contexts are very different. Um, and uh, Arnie Eisen even said this in his opening remarks about um, the, the, you know, the Jews in North America um, are a small minority. Um, they don't have. Uh, there's not a le there's not a government. Uh, um, it's hard to say wh who speaks for the Jews of North America. Um, you know, one can find quotations from various people, but nobody is actually speaking for the community. It's all voluntary. Um, and yet, at the same time, I think um, it would be an, a, an appropriate and I think wise way of thinking to say these two communities have what to learn from one another. Um, and this is not the occasion to go into that, but I, I have some thoughts about that. But the other thing is I wanted to relate to something that, that came out in David's slides that struck me as really also an interesting thing to think about uh, aside from just being upset about it, and that is, what does this word centrality mean? I mean, what does that really mean? It, it seems to me there's, um, I, and I'm not saying that to be, to say, oh, I reject it. I, I, I don't know what it means. We throw that term around. There's no kind of deep philosophical dive into that. I, I, and I think that would be important because of the way it's coming up in um, some of the findings you have in these interviews that you've conducted. That's very interesting to me. Okay, so that Barry, Beverly, microphone. Okay, I'll uh, just relate to the one question that I know about. Uh, why does Israeli education ignore uh, North American Jewry? Um, the Israeli curriculum ignores mostly everything uh, <laughs> right now and is uh, political. Uh, hours have been cut, the day is shorter. I'm just talking about in the 19 years I'm in it. Uh, and right now, it's about five points math and about STEM uh, high tech, because the perception is that uh, the economy of the country is what's most important, not necessarily the culture or the humanities uh, that we also have with us. And that's what the push is. And I can give many examples. When they send you money to teach math, and they don't send you money to teach history, you got to teach math. Um, but a uh, more serious reason is I think that the, um, I think that Israeli educators actually are afraid of the seduction of um, the, what's known, what everybody spoke about, the hegemony of culture that we know from television, and also if uh, Israeli kids would get to know the richness of, uh, of uh, religious life, the full spectrum that is possible if you're there and not here. And whereas we in this room think that that could be enriching to learn about it and create some kind of uh, bridge, but you know, that keeps the ones who are here physically here, I think that there are Israelis who are worried about the poll to there. It is not a secret that there are Israelis, uh, young people living in Berlin and want to go to Sing Singapore because the taxes are less and they're high tech. And there are big uh, uh, issues here. Um, but I do think that if there had to be a tikkun in the last 19 years, you mentioned the Beatone Commission, the tikkun Davar had to be about uh, North African and Middle Eastern Jewry, and we're not there yet. Um, because nothing was taught about them, and they're most of the Jews here. And uh, what's more important than understanding about North American jewelry if you have to do an order of priorities. And then I'll say one last thing, and maybe uh, Sharansky's going to be here. 
Um, uh, he, um, uh, Avital gave her first interview in many, many years uh, on television, and she gave it uh, because he won the Israel Prize, and now he's going to retire, and she spoke about what she did when he was in prison. And then people began to remember that the children we're teaching don't know a single thing. He said they don't know a single thing about what we went through. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a decision because the, uh, I mean, maybe he'll say something different, but because the uh, million and a half Russians who came here wanted to integrate into the society. But here, look at somebody my age. That was my entire life. Mm -hmm. Haskell Lukstein told me that I personally brought a million and a half Jews out of <laughs> Russia. Um, and I haven't yet told my students about it. Um, so there's a lot they don't know. Okay, to that about Beverly. So about your question, Avi, first of all, I want to join what my colleague said, that the Beatone Commission was sensitive to the North Africans who live in the state of Israel, it's very important to Israel. And second, your concerns about the American Jews, and that reminds me of a story that I heard a few years ago. I met a person who was about to establish the Mora Shah organization, and he was talking about how painful it was to him that children in Israel don't learn about Rabbi Massas, so we have to establish schools that will focus on the legacy of Rabbi Massas us and I said that you are very advanced. You're talking about how painful it is that the children in Israel don't know who Rabbi Massas is. And I said, I wish that the children would, Israeli children would know who Rabbi Akiva is. And you've gone as far as Rabbi Massas. So before we talk about American Judaism, let's talk about learning at Judaism. So before all of the reforms in the Ministry of Education and all of the recommendations and the new program, the new curriculum, just to understand today, in grades three, four, five, and six, five hours of Juda there are five hours of Judaism in those four grades, and that is what is the state of Israel dedicates to Jewish studies in its official curriculum, and that is already significant progress. So, with all due respect. To American Jewry, there are basic principles that are lacking. And I agree with Dr. David that we don't have to we don't have to burden the education system with everything that is important to be learned. There are many other organizations, there are many other frameworks. The pre-IDF programs are a perfect place to learn about these things. There's a limit to how much we can include in schools. About your comment, about your comments, I am convinced that this principle has learned some. Learned, I'm sure that 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 this principle learned something from this tour. I think her problem was ideological. She said, "Eitan, I'm angry about things that I heard and that I saw," and she said very critically, critically that I don't want to learn anything from them. But it was, I'm sure that she learns a lot from them, but it was very ideological. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. We have to end this very, this fascinating session. Thank you to all the speakers for their very important lectures. Thank you. We'll now take a 15 minute break. So come back in exactly 15 minutes. We're going to continue.